All right, uh, that's a good slide to start with. So uh, disruption is not so great. Uh, disruption word comes from Latin disruptus, break apart, split, shatter, break to pieces. And we generally want to avoid uh, disruption of things we care about, specifically our workloads. Uh, Kubernetes as a container orchestration system lays a solid foundation when it comes down to uh, operating highly available workloads. However, Kubernetes is not without the problems when dealing with the workload disruption. Uh, hello, my name is Ilya Chikrigin. Today, I would like to take a moment uh, to talk to you about uh, disruption in Kubernetes. And I'm a Kubernetes enthusiast. We're going to review uh, type of workload disruption as well as uh, protection mechanism offered by Kubernetes when uh, dealing with the disruption. We will look at the protection mechanism of pod budget disruption policies, or PDBs for short, and we'll see where they work, where they fall short. And finally, we'll do a quick introduction and demo of possible alternative solution and discuss, changes, uh, discuss the challenges along the way. Kubernetes classifies disruption in two broad categories. Involuntary, unavoidable cases where pod can disappear uh, due to various reasons. Hardware failures uh, backing up the node, let's say where we run in kubelet. VM failures or VM disappearances, let's say cluster administrator can delete VMs or VMs could disappear due to cloud provider or hypervisor failures. Kernel panic, uh, network partition, all this could lead to a workload disruption. Kubernetes had a couple of uh, its own reasons. Uh, kubelet can remove our pods in response to uh, resource pressures on the node, and taint manager can remove uh, workloads uh, parts in response to no execute taint. Voluntary disruptions are all other cases, and uh, again, can be subdivided in categories. Uh, some, first category, uh, those ones which initiated or consented by the workload owner. So we as a workload owner, or workload owner can delete our parts manually through kubectl. We can delete our deployments or controllers which are responsible for our parts, as well as uh, we can update our deployments, which will cause rolling uh, update, and all paths will be removed. And finally, we can use uh, different kinds of automation, like horizontal part of scaler, where essentially can result in part removal due to scale down events. Another category uh, is caused by cluster administrator or infrastructure owners, where uh, cluster administrator can scale, uh, disrupt uh, our workloads by draining nodes in order to perform repair or maintenance or upgrades on the nodes. Uh, nodes can also be drained from the cluster when we use, uh, in, response to, in response to scale down event when we use a cluster at a scaler. And finally, there is a scheduler. Scheduler also can invoke a preemption path, disrupting our workloads when it's seeking for room to run pods with, uh, in high priority class band. Kubernetes offer protection mechanism in pod disruption budget policy. It's a, full mouth, and PDB for short, so I'll be using PDB from now on. And um, uh, yeah, I'd like to think about PDB policies as a contract between cluster administrator and workload owners. We as a workload owners would like to uh, workloads being uninterruptible and be highly available, yet at the same time, cluster administrators needs to perform maintenance on the nodes, in a, essentially which will require disruption in a sense, but PDB or disruption policy is that could be viewed as a contract where essentially we can agree on how much of workload disruption we can tolerate. And uh, policies protect us against only certain type of disruption, volunteer disruption specifically, and only those in blue boxes there. So let's uh, kind of quickly review the policy anatomy. The PDB spec consists of two sections, uh, availability requirements and pod selector. The availability requirements expressed in mean, available, max, unavailable, um, essentially mutually exclusive fields, which we can define in absolute terms or relative values as percentages. The label selector is responsible for matching uh, policy to our workload parts. <clears throat> as Kubernetes 1.26, there is a new field, uh, experimental field called uh, dealing with the uh, unhealthy part disruption, and uh, I think it's 127, it's been promoted to beta. The status of uh, policy reflects current state of policy in terms of disruption availability. In fact, disruption allowed 
uh, is the only field which is used by either eviction API or scheduler when considering part removal. However, PDB status also have, have other fields and uh, which are very helpful uh, and I give a shout out to engineers who design status uh, for policies because essentially those fields help us understand why certain disruption values being computed. And also in my proof of concept, I'm heavily leveraging those uh, fields. Support for PDB in Kubernetes is complicated. If we think about PDB as a person who thrown party and Kubernetes as the invitees, who would show up? Kubelet and Taint Manager are those uh, cool kids. They ignore PDBs as if they don't exist. In fact, the uh, term uh, eviction in this context in orange boxes is a misnomer because neither Kubelet nor a Taint Manager use eviction API. They simply delete parts. And from Kubernetes perspective, when we either invoke those uh, Kubelet or Taint Manager evictions, as far as Kubernetes is concerned, disruption is already in progress. So there's nothing could be done to save the situation and effectively, in respect of, of pod state, pods could be still running. Scheduler, similar to Kubelet and Taint Manager, also doesn't use eviction API and does the pod deletion. However, Scheduler consults PDBs before removing uh, pods. <clears throat> And finally, uh, eviction API, I probably should start with it. It's a full-time beneficiary of PDBs, and essentially it will reject pod removal if policies, or once policy is being in breach. In fact, if the disruption allowed drops below zero, it will return error 429 uh, and prompting caller to attempt to evict pods later. Fun fact that we cannot use eviction or evict pods manually through kubectl command, but we still can use eviction API through directly calling the Kubernetes API. And I will show example in my demo. So what's uh, my verdict on PDBs? The good thing about PDBs, they are simple construct, uh, which fairly intuitive and easy to add to support, <clears throat> add support for disruption or against disruption for majority of our workloads. The not so good thing, PDBs are maybe too simple if not to say rudimentary. They don't have a selector which can select parts across multiple namespaces, for example. It's not universal supported. Kubelet and Tain Manager uh, ignore it. And maybe a quick example again, imagine the use case when we, when Kubelet died on a node and um, that node will be marked as not ready and uh, Taint, uh, no execute Taint will be assessed to that node, applied. So Tain Manager will wake up and say, okay, I need to delete all the parts which do not tolerate uh, no execute Taint or has expired toleration. And one of those parts could be my part for my workload. And I have uh, disruption policy protection, however that policy is in breach. So what I would really would like to happen is that Taint Manager would wait for until some other parts in my workload come in some other nodes and then delete my part. But the one, the case, that won't be the case today. Taint Manager will simply remove my parts and potentially cause an outage. And I wanna give a quick shout out to my colleagues, Andrea Tassada, Deep De Broy, and Yan Chen, who are currently working on CAP, driving the improving and augmenting Taint Manager functionality. PDBs themselves are not extensible. There is no mechanism to include additional factors when computing disruption uh, availability, whether internal or external factors. And uh, PDB do not support uh, parts with complex identity. As far as the PDB concern, all parts which match uh, selector uh, run on identical workloads with identical configurations, which may not always be a desired case. Very not so good items, um, error 500, happens when we apply or create multiple policies for a given part, in other words, overlapping policies. And it's not a trivial problem to prevent policy creation in such a way because um, parts and policy can be created in different times. That's the kind of artifact of uh, eventually consistent system. And it's also pretty challenging to add support for multiple policies per part in the eviction API. At the same time, I think maybe error 500 a bit uh, not the best choice because essentially there is no error in the survey, just roughly invalid configuration or, yes, invalid uh, relation between PDBs and policies. And also there is, uh, again, extensibility issue, but this time I'm not talking about uh, PDBs, but I'm talking about general lack of extensibility in Kubernetes for built-in types. All right, so what are those parts with complex identity I was mentioning earlier? So let's imagine the use case of uh, distributed NoSQL database, let's say Cassandra. And let's say we deploy it in Kubernetes, and typically that deployment will consist of a set of pods or maybe stateful sets, 
where each part represents database shard, and each shard is consists of uh, replicas. So essentially, paths themselves are not exactly identical. So if we disrupt pod, let's say, one, we want to maybe disqualify from disruption pod five and two. How can we protect ourselves with the policies today, disruption policies today? We kind of can attempt to model policy around replication rings, but by doing so, we quickly end up with overlapping policies where we see like uh, we have multiple pods will be covered by multiple policies, and uh, that would lead to error 500. Another option, we can scale shards themselves and uh, kind of apply policy to the shard. However, that will increase the deployment by a factor of X. And this is an example where PDBs may be not the best choice or they don't offer the protection. So how can we solve this case? One possible way uh, is to introduce a new type, uh, distributed PDB, a particular type of policy which uh, uses existing type of PDB policy yet adds and wraps it with understanding of policy federation. And I'm hesitant to use federation term here because I don't want to get confused with Kubernetes federation. The more appropriate analogy in this context would be Prometheus federation, where one instance of Prometheus database can see data from another Prometheus. Similar here, the distributed PDB is essentially that. One instance of policy can see and utilize statuses of other policies when computing disruptions allowed for itself. Uh, the distributed uh, policy controller capable of processing both regular policies and distributed policies. And for distributed version, it will create child policy, which is in turn regular policy. And for the regular policy, it would act as a drop-in replacement for built-in controller. Federation could be in one direction where we can federate with any PDB, or it could be bidirectional when those PDBs we federate with in turn being children of distributed policies as well. So let's take a look again at an example of a NoSQL database and apply distributed policies to it. This time we'll create policy for one and only one pod. However, the policies themselves will be federated with the policies which match neighboring pods or pods from the same replica ring. Thus, if, those, if a given pod gets disrupted, only policies which are kind of from the same ring will be impacted. So in this case, if we lose P1 pod, whether it's uh, uh, not ready or just being deleted, only policies P2 and P5 should be impacted and P4 and P3 should be intact. On the left-hand side, you see example of YAML, where we have exactly the same spec for policy in terms of allowed disruptions and pod selector. However, we have additional section federation, where we can uh, now name a federated policies by name, namespace, and cluster name. <clears throat> so what it allows us now to create federation which can transcend the namespace boundaries. Moreover, since we can include cluster name and we can configure our distributed PDB controller to support multiple clusters, we can transcend the cluster boundaries as well. And with that, we're going to jump to the demo section. So let's see. Now, the tricky part is to pick the right font size. Obviously, that's probably too small. Let's bump it up a little bit. Let me see. On the back, can you see it? A little bit more? Yes, no? All right, I see a thumbs up with my bad eyes. OK, so for all my demos, I'm using kind clusters running my laptop. Uh, and this is an example of single node kind cluster with distributed controller already deployed in it, distributed policy controller. And first case, I will demo example of creating deployments into different namespaces in the same cluster and attempting to solve the disruption requirements by a policy, disruption policy. So here we have uh, two namespaces. Uh, both have three pods each. And my requirement is such that I would like to have minimum three pods running. Doesn't matter which namespace. It could be one or another, three and zero, or two and one, or any combinations. So let's see how I attempt to solve it with the PDB. When I create policy with minimum three available, you will see that uh, I have allowed disruptions at zero level. So that policy now effectively is in breach. My workload is uninterruptible because policy is scoped to the namespace. Since policy at the namespace is looking at the pods, it only sees three pods. So uh, let's take a look at the YAML file. So yes, currently healthy three, desired healthy three, Nothing could be disrupted. This workload is uninterruptible, and cluster administrators won't be happy about that. And as I mentioned earlier, since we cannot use QPCL, this is the example of uh, 
submit the request for eviction directly to API. In this side, I'm running the queue proxy, and I'm calling, uh, sending to this namespace pod the combination and using the eviction subresource and providing JSON payload. So if I fire this up, I get 429, which is exactly that because there are zero allowed disruptions, and I can repeat the same command against uh, another namespace, and I should get hopefully exactly the same response. Yes, <clears throat> so yes, this is the uninterruptible workload. So uh, let's replace the policy from one namespace with the distributed version. And let's maybe bump up a little bit here. Okay, cool. So now you can see we have a distributed budget disruption policy and child object PDB. Now this time you will see that it has actually three allowed disruptions because it understands the policy from the uh, next namespace. And let's take a look. Oh, first of all, if we attempt to disrupt, we can, we get a 200, and you can see that pod was disrupted right here, new pod being created. And uh, let's take a look at the YAML. Now, let me bump it up, there we go. So uh, in the spec uh, section, we see exactly the same requirements uh, as for regular PDB, but now you will see federation section where we have name and namespace indication. The status of distributed PDB contain both child status and all federated items statuses, as well as total computed values. And if we look on the child uh, YAML file of child PDB policy, it's exactly the same built-in policy. The only difference is that we now have owner reference indicating that this policy being owned by distributed uh, version. Cool. So <clears throat> let's scale deployment in, next, uh, in other namespace to zero, just emulating disruption. So we have no parts. And as you can see now, uh, available allow disruptions drop down to zero. And if we look at the the PDB policy from other namespace, you can see currently health is zero. That's essentially what happens here. We're federating with the status, we're not looking for the parts. And by looking, observing changes to the federated status, we update the allowed disruptions in our namespace. So if we attempt to evict parts in our namespace, we get 429 as we want to. Now, as we bring parts back from another namespace, kind of when, uh, let's say, maintenance completed and recovery happening, now we can back, able to evict parts in our namespace. Moreover, as we restore all the paths, we could sh should see allowed disruption going back up to three. Now, if we attempt to evict paths from another namespace, we still can't because it's been governed by uh, built-in policy. So let's go ahead and replace that policy with the distributed version. This time, we'll, this basically creates the bi-directional federation. And now this time we can, okay, can we see it? Yes, we can uh, disrupt either paths in either namespaces without a problem because as long as total number of paths is three and above. And let's scale now them both to two and see what happens if we try to simultaneously evict parts from both namespaces. So now only one eviction should succeed and second fail because again, once first succeeds, we're gonna be in breach of the policy. And here we go, so first call succeeded and the second one have failed. And that's the example kind of, of just nutshell demoing the um, basic uh, federated policies. In my example, I used symmetrical deployment for both deployments identical and both use identical policies. However, symmetry is not required. We can have total different deployment sizes and shapes as well as different policy requirements. In next demo, we're gonna go back to our example of um, NoSQL database and we're gonna deploy it into the same kind cluster, single node cluster, and uh, we'll emulate it by just regular parts so it's easy to disrupt and see impact of it. And this first step, I'm gonna emphasize the importance of policies because if we don't use any policies protection against, uh, against disruption and cluster administrator performs maintenance on the node, they can start evicting or draining nodes without any hesitations and uh, that will result in we losing parts and then they can continue perform maintenance and more parts getting uh, disrupted and at this point in production we are in outage and people get paged because my database is now compromised, most likely there are failures and people are not happy, so let's quickly restore all the paths before anyone gets paged. And uh, let's see how we can try to solve it with the built-in policy. The use case I kind of showed in the slide before. And if I create policies per uh, replica ring, now let's take a look at the policy example, how it looks like. So this is an example of the policy which selects multiple paths. And uh, we can use that label selector to verify that selector works. It should select all the parts. Let's see, hopefully it does. Yes, and we can look on neighboring policy, let's say. But what you can see from the screen, if I resize it, 
that same pods appear in two different policies. And if you paid attention in the <laughs> slide deck, you know what happens when I'm trying to evict pods here. We're going to get error 500. And that's probably the worst case scenario because now my workload are interruptible. Cluster administrators are super not happy about it. And we're getting back 500 because now draining of those nodes will get stuck in limbo. So let's go ahead and, um, oh yes, and if we try to replace any node or delete any pod, we'll get the same 500 because all of the pods now have five matching policies. So let's go ahead and replace regular policy with distributed version. And that's where the display becomes challenging because we have so little real estate here. Okay, so hopefully you can see on the screen that we have uh, seven distributed disruption policies which resulted seven uh, regular policies. Now that's the federated option and let's see what we're gonna do next. So let's go ahead and delete one pod. We deleted replica four. Notice how when we remove replica four, uh, all of a sudden the PDBs which matching pods around the same replica ring got adjusted status to disruption allowed to zero. Now if we attempt to evict any pod from the same ring, let's say replica three, we're gonna get 429 back. So that's exactly what we want because now we actually using PDB policies, yet we don't create multiple policy per given pod. And we're able to apply protection of PDBs for our complex identity pods deployment. And uh, we still can evict remaining replica, let's say it was one, which didn't have a violation. But at this point now, across the board, we have zero allowed disruptions, and that's the minimum operating state we can perform on the database, because any more pods disrupted will lead to outage. So, uh, yeah, any pods get returned for 429. Resetting pods should restore the uh, allowed disruptions, and that's pretty much for this section of the demo. And last quick demo I'm going to show is the taking this use case of NoSQL database and deploying it across multiple clusters. So let's see. Let's clean up. All right. For this demo, I also use kind of clusters, except this time I'm using three different clusters. Uh, and I'm going to switch contexts between them three. So I have a single one cluster, the identical deployments as before. The only caveat now I'm using additional configuration to support multi-cluster mode. And what that means, I had to create separate service account and service and RBAC to extract tokens to allow controllers to talk to other clusters. So this is an example of RBAC where I'm only allowed to watch pod disruption budget policies. I don't care about pods as I mentioned before because we don't count pods or watch pods in the federation context. And uh, we're going to create separate uh, secret uh, with kubeconfig file generated for all three clusters. And let's take a look at the super secret config. So here we go. So here's a secret file where we have three contexts for each cluster, blue, green, and red, with the tokens. That config will be important when we look at the federation section. So this type, we're going to create separate panels here, and we, on the left-hand side, we're going to watch the deployments, and on the right-hand side, we're going to watch the policies. And again, I probably need to play with the adjusting sizes here so we can see better. Okay, hopefully you can see on the, on the big screen. Here's, the, on the left-hand side, we have three pods. So it's nine shard deployment of NoSQL database, and it's kind of striped across three clusters. So we have zero, 10, 20, 30, 40, and so forth, you can see. And we have matching policies on the right-hand side. Those are already distributed policies. And uh, that's kind of our database deployment. So let's go ahead and uh, yep, take a look at the policy real quick, just to see how Federation looks like. It's, now you can see in the Federation section here, we have both the cluster name, which matches the uh, cube config, namespace, and name federated, uh, federated policies. And, so let's go ahead and evict the pod. So I'm going to evict pod from the blue cluster so we can see kind of for symmetry here, changes on both uh, red and green cluster. So as we successfully evicted pod 40, you see the policy adjust here respectfully because again, we just lost this pod, but also notice how policy changed in neighboring clusters. So now if we attempt to evict pods from the, let's say red cluster, which from the same replica ring, we should get 429, and to do so if we do from the green cluster, again, we get 429. The only thing we can evict those remaining pods, so let's get, since we're in green, let's evict pod from the green cluster. 
we get uh, 201. And now that's the essentially minimum viable state of our database. If we disrupt the minimum parts, we're going to incur the uh, disruption. Oh, sorry, outage for our database. And restoring parts res should restore, yes, it should restore the allowed disruption for our uh, PDBs. Cool. Let me switch back to slides. Oops. First, I need to change the screen. All right. So I had to juggle so <laughs> easy to see. So hopefully, uh, my demo got you excited about possibilities. And surprisingly, as I mentioned, because the policies today have additional fields, the implementation of this control was relatively straightforward. So what was the hardest part? Kubernetes did a great job, fantastic job, of offering extensibility in terms of uh, custom types, the CRD and controller, or like operator paradigm, right? However, Kubernetes offers little when it comes down to extending built-in types. In order to make this uh, project work, I had to implement fully compatible disruption controller, which essentially behaves as a drop-in replacement, but also adds supports for my new type, distributed PDB. And once implementation was done, I had to disable uh, built-in controller through the controller manager flag so I can operate both controls, well, so I can operate controller without competing with each other. Both of those are pretty formidable challenges. Building a fully compatible controller to built-in, it's a full-time job because not only you need to implement for this current version, you, if you all want to go that route, you will need to implement those for all future SKUs and patches. More than full-time job. And plus, not very productive because you will be duplicating effort. And uh, disabling uh, existing controller could be not an option for users who operate clusters where they don't have access to control plane. Think about your clusters in uh, clusters of service in the public cloud, EKS, GKE, and so forth. So um, what does it leave us? The big question is if there is desire to uh, democratize the extensibility for building types in Kubernetes. Ideally, what I would like to happen, I should be able to disable somehow or indicate on my PDB types that do not, so the built-in controller does not process my types and only process specific types. Today in Kubernetes, there's already existing paradigm for that. We have a scheduler name in pod spec. We can, we can deploy and implement our own scheduler and instruct specs to pods to be processed by that scheduler. Or there is an example of what uh, ingress annotations or ingress class names today where we can operate multiple ingress controllers to process the same type and have a controllers not to compete with each other. So perhaps this uh, talk and this demo could be a beginning of conversation if we want to add support for extending processing built-in types in Kubernetes through different controllers. And when it comes down to uh, distributed PDBs, I have a question for you. Have you ever come across this or similar need where we, you need to solve the kind of disruption protection they couldn't with the existing policies. And if you did, how did you solve it? And if you didn't, uh, would you be interested in something that you just saw in my demo? Uh, I would like to hear a story, uh, your take on this and your feedback. Please uh, talk to me after this uh, presentation or reach out to me on Slack. And uh, with that, I thank you for your time this afternoon. And until next time, keep calm and disrupt. Thank you.